Hello, beauties. Um, <laughs> this is not the original intro for the video. So I re-recorded this part because the first intro that I recorded was so awful. Um, there was just like a weird vibe with it. But today we're going to be talking about clean beauty. We're going to be talking about dangerous chemicals that are in your beauty products. We're going to be talking about the way that the beauty industry markets its products to make them seem holier than thou and moral and better for your body than they actually are. We're just going to be talking about a lot of lies today, um, essentially. But I hope you like the video. Also, before we get fully started, speaking of weird vibes, actually this is not a weird vibe. This is a good vibe. Lit quite literally a good vibe. <laughs> so I am working with Balesa today for this video because we are working together to create a giveaway for everyone. So everyone who signs up to my giveaway will get either a free toy, a free vibe, or a free gift card. You get something either way. Balesa is a bi woman company for all things sexual wellness, but they are not just for women, they are for everyone. Balesa's mission is to empower everyone to embrace, explore, and celebrate their sexuality. So this toy is called the Pebble and she's a pink little beautiful thing. She suctions and she vibrates. You just press the little button and there she goes. But I really like her because she fits perfectly in the palm of your hand. So very ergonomic, no cramping involved here. <laughs> So this one is called the Demi Wand. She's super, super cute. Um, has a couple different vibration settings, but as you can see, is pretty discreet, pretty quiet, but powerful. She works on all body types because pleasure is for everyone. And I really like the flexible neck. Okay, right, so what I also really love about this company is that all their little cases are really cute, super discreet if you don't like to put your toys out on display, which I know a lot of people don't. And they're just super easy to charge. Balesa has like tons of toys on their website. You'll definitely find something that works for you and your body. Um, sexual health is very important, something we don't talk about enough. And so that's why I'm really excited about this partnership. So yeah, don't forget to enter my giveaway. You'll get a little gift. And thank you, Balesa. Okay, let's just get started with the video, y'all. Every woman needs makeup. Well, it's also confusing. I mean, some people say don't use soap. Others say that cream is bad for your skin. One of the earliest beauty history facts I learned as a kid in school was that Queen Elizabeth I wore lead face paint to get her white, ashy veneer. But this wasn't the first time lead was used in makeup. No. Lead-based makeup is thought to have been used as far back as 3500 BCE. And even after it was classified as a poison in the UK in 1631, lead was still used in makeup for hundreds of years after. A story that people hear less of, though, is that makeup was also once used deliberately as a murder weapon. Maybe still is used. I don't know. True crime aficionados keep me updated. <laughs> Giulia Tofana was an Italian alchemist who sold a poison called Aqua Tofana. Aqua Tofana was disguised as a cosmetic but supplied unhappy women with a discreet way to kill off their husbands. Quite literally, a toxin for toxic relationships. Tofana's story has been told and retold so many times, and there's so many contradictory facts. Um, some sources say she was the daughter of another poisoner. Some say she was never found and died of natural causes. Others say that she was arrested and executed for her crimes. The mythology of Julia Tofana has been exaggerated, for sure, but Mike Dash does a good job in analyzing it on his blog, A Blast from the Past. He writes that, according to 19th century scholar Alessandro Ademolo, Tofana was only one member in a group of poisoners who operated for 30 or so years. She herself died around 1651, probably in her own bed, and after, the operation was led by her business partner, Giulia Maspara. The main ingredient for the poison was arsenic, which they obtained at regular supply from a corrupt priest, Father Giulamo of Sant'Agnès in Agone. Just really quickly, I'm trying to get these Italian pronunciations right because one of my best friends is Italian, and I had her record um, some names for me. Giulia Tofana, Acqua Tofana, Alessandra De Molo. And it just sounds so bad, so I apologize. <laughs> you can call me Signora Gucci. Apparently, to disguise the arsenic, the woman turned it into a liquid and then bottled it in glass jars identified as Manna of St. Nicholas, a miraculous healing oil that supposedly was sweated from the saint's bones in far-off Bari. 
The effects that Aqua Tofana supposedly had on its victims are summarized in a warning notice to the public that was issued in Rome late in the 1650s, when fear of the poison was at its height. According to this document, the chief symptoms were agonizing pains in the stomach and the throat, vomiting, extreme thirst, and dysentery. Standard <laughs> medical side effects. While these symptoms are in line with arsenic poisoning, Adamolo cites contemporary accounts suggesting that the poison made by Spada and her associates also contained antimony and lead. Triple homicide. Another entry in Roman gentleman Giacinto Gigli's diaries mentions a fourth possible ingredient. Corrosive sublimate, a highly toxic contemporary treatment for venereal disease known today as mercuric chloride. The ladies were nothing if not thorough. <laughs> Poison is a woman's weapon. So, whether accidental or purposely, beauty products have had a long, dangerous, and deadly history. It's no surprise then that over time, many of us have become wary of the kinds of products we're putting on our faces every day. So today I want to talk about the concept of clean beauty, an alleged solution to our fears. Physician James Hamblin defines clean beauty as a movement that sometimes refers to minimal environmental impact, but more often refers to an undefined idea of purity. He says that the marketing approach behind products like these represents a new transcendent level of purity seeking. Not only must one clean oneself, but it must also be done by way of products and practices that are themselves clean. I would say the tenets of clean beauty marketing is that one, they're ingredient forward, they brag about how transparent they are and how they would never slide in harmful ingredients under your nose. Um, two, they're wellness adjacent. Not only are these ingredients fully listed out for you, they're also very beneficial to your health. None of that toxic shit that other makeup brands put in their products. And three, they're all about highlighting your natural features. If you look at any clean girl TikToks, it's always minimal makeup, dewy skin, and coordinated monochromatic outfits, which shows that she's healthy, hygienic, and organized. That slicked back ponytail literally prevents any hairs from getting out of place. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we get into clean beauty, let's address why people of the modern era might be skeptical about their beauty products to begin with. If there's a need for a clean movement, let's address the unclean products that have existed before it. Think they're trying to poison me? Before the advent of mass commercialized makeup, recipe books were a common way for people to get their hands on cosmetics and skincare. And if you look at some of these recipes, you'd wonder how the human species even survived long enough to exist into today. An example is this 1776 hair removal recipe in Toiletta Flora, which calls for quicklime, niter, and orpiment, common ingredients in historic depilatory creams. These are not safe at all. <laughs> Quicklime contains calcium oxide, which can cause skin burns, eye damage, and respiratory irritation. Niter, or potassium nitrate, can cause skin, eye, and respiratory irritation, as well as emit toxic fumes if burned at too high a temperature. Orbimint is the mineral form of arsenic sulfide, which is very toxic. It can emit toxic vapors, and if it comes into contact with the skin, it can cause scabbing, blistering, and sores, as well as possible hair loss. So I guess it does that one thing, right? <laughs> With prolonged exposure, it can even cause organ failure. In the Ugly Girl Papers, or Hints for the Toilette, an 1874 Harper's Bazaar article, an ointment of nitric oxide of mercury mixed with lard was advised to be rubbed at the edges of eyelids to restore lost eyelashes. In the early 20th century, coal tar dyes were popularly used as hair colorants. It was also famously used in a 1933 product called Lash Lure, an eyelash and eyebrow colorant, and there were detrimental effects. But... Even after blindness and at least one death documented as resulting from use of the product, it remained on the market for five more years because the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA for short, neglected to warn the public and had no regulatory authority to remove dangerous cosmetic products from store shelves. Even though it makes us feel better to think people in history were just really dumb, <laughs> there actually have been critics and experts trying to bring these harms to light for centuries. Even in the first century AD, Roman poet and satirist Juvenal wrote, This coated face, which is covered with so many drugs and where unfortunate husbands press their lips, is it a face or a sore? He was suspecting that there was something wrong with these lead-based facial powders, something toxic maybe, that was causing sores. And during the early years of Queen Elizabeth I's reign, wearing white lead face paint was very popular, as I said, but fell out of favor among many of her subjects during the Black Plague. Part of that is because there were rumors that cosmetics blocked body vapors from naturally circulating, which, um, 
might well constitute the first ever consumer health alert, according to Samuel Epstein. Throughout the 1800s, chemists were formulating more and more beauty products for the market, but it wasn't until 1906 that Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, which laid the foundation for the creation of the FDA. What happened in 1906, you may ask? Well, Upton Sinclair published The Jungle, which revealed all kinds of food adulteration and unsanitary practices in meat production, like how workers would fall to their deaths in these factories and their bodies would be ground up along with the animal meat that consumers would then eat. Yummy. So unsurprisingly, public outrage prompted Congress to establish federal responsibility for public health and welfare. What's actually ironic is that Upton Sinclair was pretty dismayed that public outrage was solely directed at their consumer goods and not at the abuse of factory workers, which was like the main point of his story. He said later, I aimed at the public's heart and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. However, there were many limitations to the Pure Food and Drug Act. In 1933, author Callett and F.J. Schlink released their book, 100 Million Guinea Pigs, Dangers in Everyday Foods, Drugs, and Cosmetics, which pushed the idea that American producers of food and drugs are using the population as test subjects. This book then prompted the FDA to put on a showing of faulty products for lawmakers. Many dangerous and fraudulent foods, drugs, and cosmetics still to be found on the market. The exhibit displayed photos of products that had either inaccurate labeling or caused harm to consumers. This exhibit featured products including Lashler, our favorite, and Coramlu. So if you don't know about Coramlu, this was a hair removal product and was successful for its time, selling over 120,000 jars within its first year. But the main depilatory agent was thallium acetate, which can cause neuromuscular damage, respiratory problems, blindness, and permanent hair loss. One woman reportedly lost her teeth, eyesight, ability to walk, and thus her job due to quorum loo. Have you ever stopped to consider what you'd look like completely bald? What? In 1938, Congress passed the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. However, under this act, cosmetic manufacturers were still not required to evaluate the safety of their ingredients which is really weird. And only after a cosmetic had injured or killed a number of people would the FDA then be able to remove that product from the market. Lovely. Two kinds of products were also excluded from the 1938 law. All soaps and coal tar dyes, such as the one responsible for the Lashler injuries. The law simply required that a label be placed on coal tar dye products, warning that blindness may result from the use of this product. Things didn't really get any better throughout the 20th century and there were few amendments to help consumers. Popular mid-century cosmetic brands like Avon produced makeup containing asbestos, a carcinogen known to cause ovarian cancer and mesothelioma. So needless to say, everyone was growing really tired of these health issues associated with their products, eventually leading to the clean consumerism movement starting in the 1960s. This is Corn Silk, a unique face powder made from corn. Yes, corn. There were a number of reasons contributing to clean consumerism. For one, there was an increased interest in environmentalism sparked by Rachel Carson's 1962 book Silent Spring, leading to consumer protection regulations, mostly with an environmental focus like the 1963 Clean Air Act and the 1970 creation of the EPA. Lack of government regulation of cosmetics, as I've talked about before, also led to the creation of the Cosmetic Ingredient Review in 1976. However, important to note, CIR does not have regulatory authority to force a company to withdraw an unsafe product from the market. Either way, consumers were getting restless and new companies cropped up to address these demands, advertising clean and green products. Everything from household cleaners to food to beauty products, with these brands essentially promising to self-regulate when the government would not step in. FinalNet has no aerosol propellants. Use non-aerosol FinalNet. However, there were some people who were hell-bent on not supporting companies at all, most popularly the hippies, along with some black activists and feminists, who championed the back-to-nature aesthetics. Some of them opted out of beauty entirely, but some chose to DIY their beauty products with items from their pantries. However, their aesthetics were inevitably co-opted by brands who marketed the natural look. These companies were still using chemical formulas, but added natural plant extracts and created color pigments that alluded to or like that recalled natural colors, like buried colored lipsticks. <laughs> A question you might be wondering is, why did beauty products use synthetics to begin with though? Because, I mean, at some point, all makeup was once natural. So why don't we just continue using the tried and true basic natural ingredients like lead and arsenic? <laughs> 
Well, other than the fact that natural doesn't always mean safer, the industry pivoted to synthetics in part because natural ingredients can also pose costly problems. In Beauty Imagined, a history of the global beauty industry, Jeffrey Jones writes, The use of pure natural products greatly raised the cost and complexity of cosmetics due to problems of spoiled ingredients. Without the employment of synthetic preservatives, plant-derived formulations, especially if not tested on animals, carried health risks unless treated carefully. One of the first examples of clean cosmetics marketing was CoverGirl's Clean Makeup campaign in 1968, which focused on the no makeup look. Creative director George Porras recalled, Once we did clean makeup, we had to get a look for it. Clean, clean, clean. That operative word ran through everything we did, everything we touched, everything we wrote. Models dressed all in white were shown boating, running, swimming. The scene was almost always in a boat, on an ocean, on a beach, or in another environment where there's a lot of wind and water, and the dominant color scheme is white and blue. CoverGirl's advertising language, like, so natural you can't believe it's makeup, expresses the contradictory desire for no makeup makeup and the belief that natural means good and healthy that we still see today. My personal take is that no makeup makeup has always been more detrimental to my self-esteem than a glam look. And that's because when I'm plastering makeup on my face, I know that the purpose is to make my face look very different and dramatized. I don't feel dysmorphic staring at my face because I'm very aware that heavy makeup is like a mask. However, the times when I've tried to do the clean girl, no makeup makeup, I feel myself getting more uncomfortable staring at my face without makeup because I find that natural makeup really emphasizes things like contour, which sort of changes your natural features like just a little. And so after a while, looking at my face without contour feels a little odd, even though these are my natural features. Does that make sense? Does anyone else feel that way? <laughs> In the 70s, natural was becoming such a movement that even products that did not look natural tried to cash in on the trend. In the February 1975 issue of Vogue, Maybelline advertised, Look Natural Mascara. Shown with light blue eyeshadow, the model did not look at all natural. The first rule in applying eye makeup is you can never wear enough blue eyeshadow. The 90s was a big decade for alternative everything, from alternative music to alternatives to meat. Alternative was basically a synonym for the hip and forward thinking. Alternative medicine, a catch-all term for anything falling outside the Western medical hegemony, was growing in popularity as well. Practices like acupuncture and homeopathy were rapidly moving from just solely being practiced by uh, Asian immigrants and white hippies to <laughs> being studied as real medical interventions. This trend was especially pronounced among young women. More girls than ever before were getting into aura reading and tofu and going to Lilith Fair. A 1993 study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that one third of respondents had sought care deemed alternative, like chiropractic therapy, acupuncture, massage, homeopathy, and spiritual healing in just the past year. I am not a businessman. I am a holistic healer. It's a calling. It's a gift. And I get it. I mean, I was raised on Tiger Bomb. And, you know, in general, there's so much distrust in our formalized Western medical system. A lot of doctors don't listen to women, especially black women. A lot of pharmaceutical companies prioritize their best interest over public health. I'm a capitalist. I'm trying to create a big drug company, a successful drug company, a profitable drug company. Different doctors give out conflicting advice. The whole system can feel very dystopian and like no one's listening to you. Nowadays, especially in cities like LA and New York, I feel like I'm always running into people who regularly or have at least tried alternative healthcare. Um, though at the same time, I think we have to address it's definitely a privileged form of healthcare. Healthcare already is expensive in the US, but also a lot of medical insurances will just not cover your energy healing or sound bath sessions. James H. Carter, MD, wrote a piece in 1995 actually predicting this. He writes, no particular form of treatment should be offered solely on the basis of a patient's ability to pay. Unless we are careful, our nation may eventually develop a two-tier system of healthcare, one for the rich and famous and another system for the poor. Natural makeup also made a resurgence in the 90s after a decade of glamour and heavy blue eyeshadow. In 1991, Bobbi Brown launched Bobbi Brown Essentials, initially offering only nude lipsticks. The line grew quickly and Estee Lauder companies acquired the brand in 1995, with Brown staying on as chief creative officer. In 2018, Brown pivoted her brand away from makeup and dove into the wellness and beauty industry. 
The launch of Evolution 18, a wellness line for QVC consisting of smoothie powders, a hair and nails vitamin, and probiotic supplements, coincided with Brown leaving Estee Lauder after 25 years due to differing views on the direction of Bobby Brown Cosmetics. Brown then launched a lifestyle brand editorial website, JustBobby.com, which aims to educate people on food, wellness, etc., and also opened a hotel in New Jersey in tandem with her wellness line. I feel like Bobby Brown's pivot to a holistic, natural lifestyle brand is in line with what we're seeing a lot of today. Many beauty companies have pivoted from just producing cosmetics to also producing skincare products or incorporating skincare ingredients into their makeup lines. A lot of this new focus on wellness is definitely inspired by Gwyneth Paltrow's success. Paltrow initially launched her brand Goop in 2008 as a homespun weekly newsletter, but since then, Goop has expanded to be an entire wellness empire, complete with a website, a podcast, nationwide stores selling beauty, cookware, and clothing, and a documentary series. Goop's whole ethos is promoting clean beauty and using labels like non-toxic, natural, cruelty-free, and organic to prove it. The problem is that these generic greenwashing labels are not defined by the FDA and so virtually promise nothing. (laughs) The terms natural and organic would imply that there's no carcinogens in these products, but in a 2008 study initiated by consumer activist David Steinman and the Organic Consumers Association, they conducted a laboratory analysis of 99 personal care products branded as natural and organic and found that 45 of them contained detectable levels of the carcinogen 1,4-dioxane. 1,4-dioxane, by the way, does not appear on product labels as it is not intentionally added to products. It's created as an accidental byproduct during manufacturing. Um, so yeah, the FDA does not require that companies add... Um, hidden carcinogens onto their labels because those things, those carcinogens are not created like purposely, which, you know, is very stupid because the carcinogens are still in the products, (laughs) whether or not they're purposely there. I feel like it's pretty general consensus that people know that natural and organic are misleading labels, but something people don't know about enough is that fragrance-free is a botched term as well. You would think that fragrance-free means that there are no fragrance chemicals in the product, but manufacturers can legally add unidentified fragrance ingredients to mask foul odors generated by other chemicals and still call the product fragrance-free. Ah, smells like the old government cover-up. Similarly, hypoallergenic, allergy-tested, and safe for sensitive skin mean nothing because manufacturers are not required to do any skin testing to validate these claims nor do these claims need to be proven to the FDA or any other regulatory body. To some extent, people are aware that these labels mean nothing right. According to the Euromonitor International Voice of the Consumer Beauty Survey, U.S. consumers looking for natural or organic features in skincare have fallen since 2015. This has led companies to instead push free-form claims or ingredient exclusion lists, which leaves less room for ambiguity. These exclusion lists tend to include endocrine disruptors, and if you don't know what an endocrine disruptor is, these are substances that interfere with your hormones' normal functions. What I've noticed, though, is that companies like Goop mostly highlight synthetic endocrine disruptors like phthalates and PFAs, not natural ones. Researchers have actually found that persistent exposure to lavender oil products is associated with premature breast development in girls and abnormal breast development in boys. But Goop doesn't talk about lavender oil because, as Timothy Caulfield, the Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy at the University of Alberta says, Goop is spreading chemophobia, the irrational fear of chemicals. He says, I don't know a universe where chemicals don't exist. But that's the narrative that brands like Goop and Honest Company like to sell, and unfortunately, it's extremely effective. Another synthetic endocrine disruptor that gets a lot of attention are parabens. A lot of companies will brag that their products are paraben-free, and that's because for a while, there were a bunch of news headlines that linked parabens to breast cancer. However, the big 2004 research paper led by Philippa Darber that is constantly cited as the origin of this theory has been largely discredited since publication. Darber even clarified later that year, nowhere in the manuscript was any claim made that the presence of parabens had caused breast cancer. But people ran with it anyway. The issue is further complicated by companies recognizing a specific ingredient is blacklisted by consumers and instead will substitute with other ingredients that may be equally bad or worse. A lot of companies that say their products are free from parabens use 
methylisothiazolinone. <laughs> I don't even know if I pronounced that correctly, but this ingredient is associated with allergic reactions. But no one's checking for this ingredient because it's too long to pronounce, <laughs> and there also are not any news headlines talking about it. Parabens are like the wizard, meanwhile there's so many other toxic ingredients hiding behind the curtain. Oh. Pay no attention to that methylisothiazolinone behind the curtain. While I absolutely advocate for companies to remove harmful ingredients from their products and to raise awareness of it, it just feels like a disingenuous marketing tactic and then also gives people a false sense of safety like, oh, the big bad paraben is gone, this product is completely okay now, when um, that might not be the case. But overall, this has contributed to the rise of the ingredient-led revolution. So what that means is that right now, consumers are really focused on specific product ingredients. So not only are companies saying they don't have parabens, they'll also spotlight certain trendy active ingredients. Ingredient-led marketing is just another form of clean beauty because it implies that there's no nonsense in the bottle. You are getting pure, clean ingredients. You are getting niacinamide, and that's it. What's personally annoyed me about the ingredient love movement though is that a lot of people have a very baseline understanding of these ingredients. Like you go on TikTok and someone tells you that vitamin C is a miracle worker for your skin and to an extent sure that's true but what they don't tell you is that if you use vitamin C with a soap-based cleanser it's less effective. To make it through your skin's acid mantle, vitamin C is best when formulated with a low pH, below 3.5. But according to Leslie Bauman, MD, soap-based cleansers have a high pH, so using this kind of cleanser will ultimately decrease the skin's ability to absorb vitamin C. Collagen is also a useless ingredient in skincare if you think it's going to improve your skin elasticity, which is usually what collagen is marketed as doing. And that's because collagen molecules are too heavy to be absorbed by your skin. At this point, ingredients are the new organic natural buzzwords because just because a product has this ingredient doesn't mean it's going to benefit your skin in any way. And there are so many products now that I feel like the chances of combining ingredients that don't work together is much higher than before when all people did for their skincare routines was wash their face and put on moisturizer. But like those greenwashing buzzwords, ingredient-led products are all about signaling that I'm of a certain class, a high-class group of people who are meticulous about what they're putting on their faces and intelligent enough to know about what's in their products. Bauman explains that expensive products tend to sell well not despite their price, but because of it. She says, it's really sad. I'll have a lady come in with creme de la mer and these $600 creams and she thinks she's doing everything right for her skin, but she's not on a sunscreen and she's not on a retinoid and she's not on vitamin C. The next patient will be someone who comes in and feels guilty that she's not taking better care of her skin because she's busy taking care of her kids. She's only using sunscreen and a little vitamin A. I laugh because the second lady is doing better for her skin than the first. And on top of all this, another glaring issue is that a lot of labels are straight up wrong. <laughs> The Environmental Working Group, EWG, looked into labels of 14,200 products and about half of them turned out to have mislabeled ingredients. Some ingredient names were misspelled, other names for the same ingredient varied according to the manufacturer. The EWG also identified 41 online retailers of cosmetics that failed to post ingredient lists at all. So to me, clean beauty marketing has always been about virtue signaling at best and giving a false sense of safety so that consumers don't actually look into their products at worst. Last year, Biden signed into law the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023, which includes the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act, MOCRA, of 2022. And according to the FDA website, MOCRA is the most significant expansion of the FDA's authority to regulate products since 1938. Among these updates include the requirement that any facility that manufactures or processes cosmetic products intended for sale in the U.S. has to register with the FDA. It requires manufacturers, packers, and distributors of cosmetics intended for sale in the U.S. to submit to the FDA lists of products and ingredients information, including location of manufacture and the ingredients of any fragrances or flavors. It imposes greater record-keeping obligations regarding public safety and reporting, documenting, and following up on serious adverse events with an expanded definition of what constitutes a serious adverse event, and it imposes new labeling requirements. A lot of these things, honestly, I thought the FDA was already doing before I started researching this video, so that's hot. But a lot of cool improvements, I guess. <laughs> but some things that are important that are not introduced in the new law, 
The new law does not authorize the FDA to conduct annual investigations into the safety of ingredients or in certain cases restrict or prohibit the use of ingredients like per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAs, or so-called endocrine disruptors. I love talking about this stuff, but I cannot wait until the end of this video because I feel like my tongue has been moving in ways trying to say these words um, and it's just not been it's just been not been good for me <laughs> the new law also does not address or alter the existing guidelines for cosmetic labeling and marketing issues such as defining or restricting use of certain terms like natural clean non-toxic or safe it does not provide guidance on how much support brands need to make certain claims such as scientific studies customer surveys or third-party certifications and it does not address greenwashing or environmental impact claims, which have been the focus of recent legislative action in the United Kingdom and the EU. And lastly, it fails to address whether and under what conditions a product can claim to be environmentally friendly, green, or zero pollution in its marketing. So there's definitely a lot more things to consider, a lot more things to uh, include in the next update, which I hope will not take another 90 years or so. Honestly, I've really struggled educating myself about the beauty sector because I am not a woman in STEM. I cannot pronounce half of these scientific names. And there's just straight up not a lot of research, whether that's because there's not enough interest or if research costs are too much or if big oil is lobbying against these initiatives, I don't know. But what I really want to remain optimistic about is that I think the ingredient-led revolution can introduce these conversations about what we're putting on our bodies, what we're putting in our bodies. I think becoming more informed is never going to hurt you. And I think that while there's a lot of misinformation out there, um, I feel like we're still moving ahead at least in trying to parse through that information, you know, versus like back in the, the 90s or whatever when people didn't care at all what was in their products or they didn't know what any of these ingredients meant. At least now we'd have some, some baseline knowledge of what, you know, vitamin C does for you. And, you know, until the FDA and until these regulation bodies, regulatory bodies figure out how to keep consumers safe, I just hope we're not putting anything akin to lead on our bodies. I honestly really can't believe big lead got away with it for literally thousands of years, but enough is enough. <laughs> All right, this is the end of the video. Thank you all so much for sticking around this long. Um, once again, I have a Patreon, I have a podcast, and I have social media if you want to support me in any other way. Anyways, thank you so much and have a lovely rest of your day. I'll see you next time. Bye.